Ragnarok, that fated day that so troubles the mind of Odin, and becomes one of the primary focuses of surviving Norse myth. A great battle will be fought on that day, the day Odin will die. But what is the meaning of Ragnarok, and what might Celtic myth help tell us about it? Hi friends, this is Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Much thanks to all of my supporters. The word Ragnarok comes from an Old Norse combination of Regna, meaning gods, and Rok, meaning perhaps fate or judgment. Regna likely has a common origin with Old English Regen, meaning mighty, solemn, wondrous, and it's thought by some to come from Proto-Germanic, meaning decision or counsel, so it might be that Regna means the deciding ones or advising ones, but it depends on when this word is used first to describe the gods. My suspicion is that it has a closer meaning to the Old English, making them the mighty ones or the wondrous ones. Rok comes from Proto-Germanic rako, meaning unraveling, and in the Old Norse means fate or course. So the fate or destiny of the gods seems to be a good translation. In surviving sources, this fate is not only called Ragnarok, but also Aldarok, meaning destiny of the age, Tuarok, destiny of the gods, and Tha Erregen Dea, when the gods will die. The details of the event to come are as grim as the name implies. One of the first signs of the coming doom will be the crowing of the crimson rooster, Fjallar, and the golden rooster, Gullinkambi who resides in Valhol. It is said that it will be a time when brother will fight brother, sister's children will defile kingship, an axe age, a sword age, shields are riven, a wind age, a wolf age. Before the world goes headlong, no man will have mercy on another. These elements are of a common Indo-European origin. The ancient Greek poet Hesiod says of the present age, the Iron Age, that Zeus will come to destroy us when the father will not agree with his children, nor the children with the father, nor will brother be dear to brother as aforetime. Men will dishonor their parents, knowing not the fear of God. Might shall be their right. One man will sack another city. In Celtic tradition, the same type of prophecy is made by the Morrigan after Lug secures victory over the Fomoyrians, beginning with great praise and blessing to be had in the present, but she warns, I do not see a world of the living. Summer will be without flowers, cows will be without milk, women without modesty, men without valor, conquests without a king, a wall of spear points on every plain, Forests without mast, sea without fruit, great unbelievable torment, battles waged everywhere, treacherous princes, false maxims of judges, every man a betrayer, every son a brigand, evil time in which son will derange his father. Separated by massive space and time, all three accounts of the precursor to this great period of destruction agree with each other and one might suggest that this is indeed our present age that is being discussed. And much of it has to do with strife, rejection of tradition, false laws, and a breakdown of the family. However, unlike Greek myth, there is a much stronger dualistic interpretation of events in Norse and Celtic tradition. 
While Hesiod says Zeus will destroy the current race of men, Norse myth ascribes this destruction to a separate group of destructive divinities, the sons of Muspelheim. In the time of destruction there will be three unending winters. Then everywhere will spread chaos and war for greed and all sorts of evils. Then the two wolves shall swallow the sun and moon, the stars will vanish, the trees will be torn up, and the crags fall to ruin, and all the fetters and bonds in the world will be broken. Then the wolf Fenrir will be set free, and his bottom mouth will be against the earth, and his top against the sky, devouring everything between. The great serpent will stir up the waters against the land and blow poison through the air. Mighty in destruction are the sons of Loki. Sutur will lead then with fire all about him and his sword flashing brighter than the sun. They shall cross the Bifrost bridge with Hrimr, Loki and the Rima giants and all the warriors of hell. And when they cross that bridge will shatter. Freyr will battle Sutter and fall without his sword. Tyr will face Hrim, the Hound of Hell, and both will slay each other. Thor, with his mighty hammer, great defender of the world, strikes down the great serpent, using his great power. But all humankind save two will die in that battle, and after nine steps the mighty warrior will fall from the poison of the serpent. Then Odin, having consulted the head of Mimir, long dreading the day, will pour forth with his warrior band of dead heroes, wearing his great golden helmet gleaming like the sun and brandishing his mighty spear, he will never stop fighting, even as Fenrir swallows him alive. But before the wolf can consume all space between earth and sky, Vidir, son of Odin, will surge forth to avenge his father with one well-soled foot on the mouth of the wolf. He will plunge his sword into the beast's heart. Loki and Himdalr will fall together in the fighting. Then Sutter, having defeated Freyr, will spread flames that will engulf the world. But Ragnarok is not the end of the world. It is a new beginning. Vithar, the wide ruling one, prevented the wolf from devouring space, and together with Vali, will inhabit the Ida plain in Asgard. Then the sons of Thor will join them, and Baldr and Hother will return from hell. The land will rise again from the sea and be green, the two surviving humans will repopulate the world again. The sun will have a daughter that will rise once more to shed her light over the land. Over many years, the gods in council will name men and places as they were before, so that those gods that were spoken of will be named so again, and all will soon be as it was. This later bit of the old gods also re-emerging as indistinguishable from times past is only found in Snorri Sturluson, but I think that this view is correct. Firstly, because the gods can only be subdued, not destroyed, unless all of existence were destroyed, which is impossible. Secondly, because this process is in keeping with the regeneration of the world described in Voluspa. It is the death and rebirth of the world, and the gods are part of that world. After the rebirth is followed a golden age, like winter passing into summer. There are those who disagree with this view, claiming this rebirth element is a later Christian adaptation, and that in origin, the Norse belief was of a grim end to everything, a belief of total annihilation and nothingness. What we see in Norse myth is common in pagan naturalistic beliefs that focus on the cyclical natural patterns of the world. As day passes into night and returns to day, so summer into winter into summer. 
So one age to the next, a tree grows, withers, and then dies, but its seed grows up again from the earth to begin anew. But this isn't just a theory, there is proof that Ragnarok is the renewal of the world, and it's to be found hundreds of years before our first written Icelandic sources, in the words of an Irish monk. Tirachan was born sometime around 640 AD and traveled widely throughout all Ireland. He wrote on St. Patrick in a work called The Collectania. It's important to point out that this was a time in Ireland when Druids still existed, as stated by Tirachan himself, and so his knowledge about their beliefs is first-hand. He details an interaction that the High King of Tara, Loigara had with St. Patrick while the saint attempted to convert him. Loigara told him he could not accept Christianity because his father, Neil, had bade him to be buried at Tara following a particular and specialized ritual. He was to be buried on the ridges of Tara with weapons in hand face to face with the sons of Dunlang until the day of Erdatha. Tirchan explains that this Irdatha is what the Druids call the Day of the Lord's Judgment. So he is to be buried, armed, and this is related to a day associated with the Christian end times. Erdatha means renewal, restoring, refreshing, or celebration. And the practice associated with it is clearly not of any Christian origin which Tirachan makes plain by ascribing the view to the Druids. It is very likely that this Irdatha of the Druids is in origin related to Ragnarok of the Norse. The practices carried out by Loigara seem related potentially to those of the cult of Odin. Perhaps significantly, Loigara names his son Lugith, a name based on the god Lug a Gaelic god that may have been interpreted as Odin in some instances, as he is directly related to kingship and war, as well as binding power. It may have mattered where someone was buried as to what afterlife they accessed, and Loigara's method was less common. Based on the description, we can make two plausible guesses at his beliefs. He either believed that during Erdatha, he would be resurrected in his body and would have to combat his enemies, or that he would transition into the other world to battle his enemies and fight in the time of Erdatha. In either case, that he needed his weapons with him in order to fight in relation to this day shows a similar belief in a great battle that is to take place, that he will be taking part in. If we compare that to Norse myth, we might say that he would be one of the Enharjar of Odin, who will fight alongside him at Ragnarok. Although perhaps such an exact parallel is a leap to make. Yet we can say with certainty that whatever High King Loigara's beliefs were, they seem somehow reminiscent of what we see in much later Norse myth where Erdatha focuses on the restoring aspect of the transition, the Norse name Ragnarok focuses perhaps on the destruction element, but both refer to the same event. When Tirhan recorded this information about Erdatha, it was certainly before 670 AD. This is the dawn of the Viking Age, 500 years before our first Icelandic sources, but also before major Viking settlements in Ireland, giving no reason to assume that King Loigara and the Druids were somehow being strongly influenced by Norse paganism. But why then do we have no Irish tales about this Erdatha, if it was such an important event? Well, we may just... Like Norse myth, some of the details that we know about the gods is how they will die, though in Celtic myth this has been altered 
to how they have already died in order to present them as mortal ancestor figures. Nevertheless, there is some evidence that at least some of these death stories belonged to pre-Christian belief, in that some correspond to information in Welsh sources. For instance, Welsh Fae's burial site is said to be beneath the waves, beyond the reach of the prophecy. In most Irish accounts, his counterpart, Lu, fell beneath the waves at the hand of Makul. In both cases, his death is connected to being under the water, with the sea being the border between worlds, and must relate to a common story that is of at least Iron Age origin. The Welsh version even hints that this is in relation to a possible end times event. According to the death tales, most of the gods died during the second battle of Mugtura, and so the version of the story that we get is muddled with contradictions within its own pages. Ogma is said to die battling Indech, yet is alive in the very next section. The Dagda, like Thor, is said to win his fight but dies of the wound delivered to him by Kethlin. Yet according to the list of kings, he serves as king for 80 years after Lu. Yet no myth gives any real details about the Dagda's 80-year rule, and all surviving tales indicate that Lug was overthrown by the grandsons of the Dagda who were in turn destroyed by the Milesians, meaning that the Dagda never actually served as High King. At any rate, the Dagda, Nuada, Macha, Ogma, and many others were said to have died in the Second Battle of Magtara. Lug triumphs alongside his warrior band. He was said to have gathered all of the Slug Shia to fight with him in the battle. And those are the fairy spirits of the air associated with strong winds and the dead. Other myths detail how he put great effort into planning for this coming battle with the Fomoirians, the tale of his father's murder and his bargain and revenge upon the sons of Turin show how he plots in order to acquire all the wondrous items and weapons of the world in order to use them in the coming battle. So it's possible, just possible, that the second battle of Magtarid was originally about a battle that was yet to happen, or is fused with one that was, and that the timing of the narrative was changed in order to fit into the now Christian framework that changed the myths into historical ancestral battles. Sources such as the Hawk of Achille confirm that after Lug's victory over Balor, there was a golden age, a great era of peace, an extended summer where the trees were heavy with fruit, where there were no lies, no murders, no broken oaths, no cowardice or malice. This mirrors the type of golden age after Ragnarok in Voluspa. It was said to have been through the great arms and weapons of the Eldanach that had slain so many Fomoirians and allowed for no transgressions. In any case, Ragnarok or Erdatha is not the end of the world but its rebirth. Like when a forest fire ravages the land, the seeds buried in the earth sprout forth anew. The gods who die will return in their proper season, just as the leaves drop from the trees in autumn and sprout green in the warmth of springtime. When the birds return to sing their harmonious songs, and the sun is reborn to shed the light of the gods upon the high hills and the damp lowlands, and the faces that turn to the heavens in wonder at the daylight sky. The two sons of Odin, the two brothers will inhabit the heavens. A hall will stand more beautiful than sunlight thatched with gold. At Gimla, there bold men will dwell and enjoy cheer through their lives. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please hit the like button, subscribe, and as always, stand tall.